Hello, everybody. Welcome to the, the Decoding COVID-19 virtual seminar series. This is the 10th speaker in this series. And as of now, the last speaker in this series. Uh, the series has covered all aspects of this disease from basic biology through clinical manifestations, through societal impact, uh, through uh, the glaring uh, representation of inadequacies in healthcare delivery uh, in underserved populations. Uh, and today we have, uh, a, we're very lucky to have a, a truly gifted speaker who's going to talk to us about the immunity uh, and vaccine development. If there was ever a time where we needed immunity and where we needed a vaccine, this is one of those times. Uh, so this is a, a very, very uh, exciting talk that we're about to hear. Uh, I thank our speaker, Sharon Rounds, is going to introduce the speaker. I thank all of you for coming to join us, uh, and I hope you enjoy the seminar. Thank you very much. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Galit Alter. She's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a group leader at the Reagan Institute. Her work uh, focuses on uses of systems biology tools to define uh, correlates of immunity against infectious diseases. And uh, she uh, also seeks to advance rational vaccine design and uh, figure out how vaccines can be uh, fully functional, leveraging the um, humoral uh, immune response. Uh, Dr. Alter, um, uh, received her uh, doctorate at McGill University and did postdoctoral training in the Partners AIDS Research Cent uh, Center at uh, Mass General. Uh, we're just very, very pleased to have you with us today, Galit, and we, uh, I would like to say for the uh, audience, uh, please enter your questions or comments into the chat function. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have an opportunity to address them. So take it away. Thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you both so very much. Um, so as the last speaker, um, I hope that we'll um, leave the seminar series with a bit of a bang. Um, we're gonna take a little bit of a deep dive into immunology of coronavirus infection, specifically focus on SARS, Cove 2 infection. And hopefully what I'll leave you with today is a little bit of a sense of what these immune responses mean, specifically antibody responses, as well as how we're thinking about these to advance um, therapeutics and vaccine development. So what I thought I would do, but just by, I want to start off by thanking my collaborators at Brown, since this is a seminar for Brown University, and just um, say, you know, one really big thank you to Emily Oster, who basically introduced me to the world of explaining COVID infection in a way that is not only relevant to scientists and physicians. And so I have to send her a very big thank you <laughs> um, for, for her efforts in, in really bringing information about immunology to the world. And I also wanna thank Jeff Bailey, who's also a very good friend um, at uh, Brown University, for really thinking about how we can collaborate here in the Northeast to make a real dent in the pandemic that's hitting us specifically uh, in this region. So with that, I just wanna start off today with you know, two questions for this group. And, and hopefully the seminar will get to these. And I hope that in the discussion, we can begin to really start to think through um, what this data mean. Um, but the question I ask myself every day, and I should say the question I ask my lab every day is what do these antibodies mean that we study? What are we um, trying to understand about the humoral immune response to SARS-CoV-2? And how can we begin to think about this data in a way that we can both begin to understand what immunity really means in the, uh, in the setting of this particular pandemic and how can we use that information not only to get back to business, as Emily calls it, but also to think about how we can inform the selection of the best vaccines and the deployment of that type of tool to really make us all safe against this virus. And then secondly, to help you think through the tools that we've been developing over the last few months um, for this particular virus to begin to understand exactly how these antibodies provide protection from infection. 
So I always like to start with a slide just to think about how this tiny little virus really stopped the world. Um, and what I'm showing you here are just a few images that really, you know, um, yank on my heartstrings. You know, on the left side, we have a picture um, of the empty streets that we've seen over the last few months that are slowly being repopulated, really because of the effect of this virus and the lack of understanding that we have within the medical and immunological community about what it means to be protected against this virus. Simply understanding what immunity looks like will re-empower us to basically take those streets and really give us that strength of understanding that allows us to really begin to combat this pathogen more effectively. In the middle, I love to show this image. I don't know if you saw this on CNN, but it's the jellyfish that have begun to swim again in the Venice canals. And so even though we have all begun to hide in our homes and slowly coming back out into the world, nature has really begun to reinvigorate. And on the right side, I'd like to show this image of pollution in the New England area. And just to show how you know, things have changed from the bottom where we saw what pollution looked like in this area to what it's looking like now in the top image. So things have recovered while we've been um, behind our doors. And importantly, so has our understanding of immunology. So what I thought I would just show is one more um, little funny joke that I like to start off with. And this is really what we've been doing, scratching our heads as we study antibodies against the coronavirus. Um, and really thinking about the fact that we've been developing sophisticated ways of understanding antibody levels and what antibodies might mean against this virus. But really where we are still in the setting of this particular pandemic is trying to understand exactly what thresholds and qualities of antibodies might be most relevant against the particular infection. So um, everything really began um, in probably late February and beginning of March when you know, there were news coverage of all this debacle in the development of tools to study antibodies. Um, on the left side, I'm showing you um, a press release out of the White House where essentially the White House had tasked scientists, not companies, not the government, but really scientists at institutions like um, Brown and Harvard to go out and start to develop tools to measure antibodies to begin to empower us with the ability to understand who was and who wasn't infected. Unfortunately, hundreds, if not thousands of tests began to appear on the market and slowly but surely an outcry emerged from the scientific community on the right side demanding quality checks on these assays because many, many assays had begun to appear that were really reporting false or poor data. And this really led to a major demand from the scientific community to create stringency and quality assurance within the development of tools to assess antibodies. So we would make sure that what we were reporting back to our patients or back to the community were really valid data to help us, in, to inform us about what levels of immunity were really prevalent in the population. As you may or may not have seen, there were numerous articles across multiple different reporting outlets showing on the left side the release of tests that were actually giving higher levels of false uh, positive reports as opposed to accurate reports. And on the right side, many different institutions, including our own, Brown, and many others, had began to collect tests from all over the world to begin to try to understand which tests were the most accurate so we could begin to really understand what levels of immunity were out there in the community. And so I'd like to start off with a little bit of, a, just a little bit of an apology um, for bad science. I think that this is really an example of how, you know, the wrong kind of science got out into the public as opposed to the right science that was being done at our institutions. And so putting aside all that terrible science in the midst of all that chaos that had emerged because of this frenzy that emerged in the community um, following this outbreak, we and other institutions began to build high quality assays. And so in our backyard right here at the Reagan Institute, we began to build an ELISA very rapidly. Starting in mid-February, we began to build the tools that we began to assemble into a high quality quantitative ELISA that would allow us to understand exactly what levels of coronavirus specific antibodies were present in individuals who were exposed or infected. We built the ELISA in early March. We began to essentially 
pivot to make it clinically diagnostically relevant. We qualified the assay, got it ready for validation within our CLIA lab, and we began to disseminate this assay to multiple different labs across the US as well as across the entire world, sending the protocol to East Africa, West Africa, South Africa, Europe, to South America, as well as to Asia, really to build capacity to essentially have an assay out there that would give us reliable data. And more importantly, an assay that would be scalable and unbelievably cost effective, really bringing down the cost of the assay to less than 50 cents a test. We began to automate this assay very quickly with the governor's task force here in Massachusetts. We commercialized the assay with partners and essentially began to build a testing platform that would allow us to really begin to collect data at a global level so we could begin to think through the public health implications of antibody positivity, not just here in Boston, but really at a global level. But what I want to talk about today is not so much about how we built this assay, and why it is so important to have reliable antibody tools. But to point out one really interesting phenomenon that we and many others have noted when we've been looking at antibodies in the population. What I'm showing you here is just an example of some of our earliest antibody results, testing convalescents, so individuals who were SARS-CoV-2 positive and then had um, recovered from the infection compared to a number of controls. Um, we're looking here at the IgG levels, the IgA levels, and the IgM levels to the SARS-CoV-2 virus across these individuals. And the only point I want to make here, which I think was really startling to me, and what really got me excited about the immunology of this infection, was the fact that in a group of convalescents, some individuals had really high levels of antibodies, whereas other individuals had very low levels. There was this incredible spread of immunity in the population. That was true for IgG, our workhorse immunoglobulin, the most dominant immunoglobulin in the blood. It was true for our mucosally relevant IgA antibody that we think is critical for protection in the lung, as well as our early IgM antibody that's involved really in that early response and containment of pathogens. And for each of these, the signal was clearly higher in the convalescence undetectable in the controls, but more importantly, there was this incredible range of positivity that got us asking ourselves, are these individuals the ones that are protected and these individuals down here not protected? And how do we begin to understand what level of antibody is vital for moving us into this protective, um, uh, to understanding what protection really means? So we began to profile larger populations of individuals. We began to look not only at their overall levels of antibodies, but also at the quality of their antibody response. And what I want to show you here is really the level of heterogeneity of antibody profiles that we see across populations of individuals. Appreciation for really how diverse our response is to this particular virus. So what I'm showing you here is a heat map of the SARS coronavirus 2 antibody response. We're looking at the response in a group of RNA negative individuals, so these are controls, as well as a group of RNA positive individuals, where features that are highly red in the heat map are very positive, and features that are very blue are quite negative or non-existent. And those here in this kind of light uh, yellowish are really just there at baseline and really not uh, present at all. And the point I want to make here is if you look in the RNA positives, we see very clearly here that there are very cold or low level cross reactivity of, against um, any of the uh, profiles that we looked at in the population. Whereas in the RNA positives, for many features that we analyzed, there was really quite different responses. And more interestingly, there were no two individuals. Every column here is a different individual. Every row is a different feature we analyzed. And there were no two individuals that were identical. Every single person that we analyze has a unique antibody fingerprint against the virus. Now, what I'm showing you here, which I just want to draw your attention to for a minute, is the fact that when we were looking at different antibody profiles in these individuals, we're looking at different subclasses of antibodies. So in humans, we make four different IgG subclasses, IgG1, 2, 3, and 4. We make IgAs that are mucosally relevant and IgMs that are involved in the early response to the virus. 
But we also make antibodies that can bind and activate innate immune cells to kill pathogens by binding to different receptors called FC gamma receptors. And what we're looking at here is the response to the nucleic capsid antigen in the N, the spike antigen that's involved in attachment of the virus to the host cell, as well as to the receptor binding domain of the SARS coronavirus to the RBD, which is a tiny little portion of the spike which is involved in attachment. And when we look at these responses across these three different antigens and across all the different flavors of antibodies that one can make against the virus, what we saw is this rich heterogeneity in profiles where early in infection, these individuals on the left seem to have low but positive immunity. And as individuals became more infected, as I'll show you in just a minute, they develop a richer density of these responses, but again, quite variable from individual to individual. So to visualize this a little bit more simply, what I'm gonna show you here is the evolution of the response in these individuals over time. Same data, and now what I'm showing you over here is how these responses evolved. And I'm gonna give you as an example over here is the IgG1 response in these individuals. So this is your workhorse antibody that is in the blood, our highest level antibody that fights most pathogens. And what I'm showing you here is days from, infect, uh, from symptoms on the, y, on the X axis and the level of these antibodies on the Y axis. On the left side are the levels in the RNA negatives and on the right side are the individuals who are RNA positive. And what we're looking at here in different shapes is the response in the square to the spike antigen, which is the top here, this little red umbrella that's involved in attachment to the cell the receptor binding domain, which is this tiny little area on the very top of the spike, that's actually the receptor binding domain, the part of the spike that is involved in binding to the host cell, and the nucleic capsid, a control antigen is found within the actual virus. And so we're looking at that as just an internal control in the um, humoral immune response to the virus. And hopefully what you can see here in the IgG1 response, for each color, this is a different one of these three antigens. Hopefully you can see this rapid evolution over the first three weeks of infection of the immune response to all three of these antigens with a little bit higher levels of the response very early on in infection in the purple here to the spike and in the red here to the nucleic capsid, the two um, responses that are typically used for testing antibody prevalence in individuals. And interestingly, by day 10 to 14, most individuals have seroconverted, really telling us that in the first two weeks of infection, almost everyone develops an antibody response to the pathogen. And for IgG1, we see very low cross-reactivity to most antigens, except for maybe a little bit to the nucleic capsid, this internal region of the virus. Now, we look at the same um, type of profiles across all the different other flavors of antibodies. And what I want to draw your attention to is just the differences in the shapes of these curves. And I think this, this is really important because this tells us that individuals are responding to the virus in different ways. And these different flavors of responses, what I'm going to try to convince you of, is really what matters for protection from infection, not necessarily just the overall level of antibody one has in their blood. So if we look here at the IgG2 response, this is uh, another subclass we make against different pathogens. What you can see here is this very different level of immunity that evolves in this IgG2 response to the nucleic capsid here in the red compared to the spike or the RBD down here where we make much lower levels. So very different within individuals across the different antigens within the virus. The RGG3 levels that are our most functional, really antiviral antibody subclass, these emerge relatively early. And interestingly, they emerge very, very quickly against the nucleic capsid. And then later on, the spike and the receptor bunny domain antibodies catch up. IgG4s that are really not very functional don't really come up in this infection, which is actually quite a positive. But now if you look at our mucosal antibodies or our early IgM antibodies, what we see here is this very rapid response, and interestingly, more rapid response for Ig and IgM than we even see for IgG1, which typically is what we measure to actually assess immunity within populations. 
The IgA responses, almost everyone seroconverts by day 10 following infection, as well as for IgM. And these responses really stay quite strong over the first three weeks of infection with very high levels of these IgAs and IgMs. The problem with these IgA and IgMs, although they seem to be really fantastic at early detection of infection, is that we do see cross-reactivity within these isotypes to, um, in the RNA-negative individuals. So this becomes quite complicated from a diagnostic development standpoint. But from an immunological perspective, this is quite interesting that we raise these antibodies very early on, this mucosally relevant antibody, as well as this early, very potent antibody, um, and these responses stay up, even in the face of high levels of IgGs escalating. But even more interestingly, from my perspective in the immunology world, is if we look at the types of receptors that these antibodies can interact with, FC receptors that are present on innate immune cells that are responsible for driving the elimination of infected cells, what we see here is even more rapid escalation and development of functional antibodies across all these individuals with very similar kinetics of this evolution across all of the different antigen specificities. So what this tells us that in the setting of this coronavirus infection, there are variable evolutions of different isotypes and subclasses of antibodies, but a coordinated and highly deliberate evolution of functional antibodies that are likely responding in most individuals to the infection, aimed at clearing, eliminating, and curing individuals of the disease. Now, if we can begin to understand how these antibodies work, what my lab has been focused on is thinking about how we can translate this information for vaccine development. Now, one question that's come up in the field that I wanna just get into before we get into some of the deeper immunological analysis is this possibility that some antibodies that arise in the setting of SARS-CoV-2 infection may arise from cross-reactive antibody responses to other common coronaviruses. So to begin to understand how cross-reactivity might be involved in the developing immune response to this particular infection, what we began to look at is the evolution of the SARS-CoV-2 response across antigens within the actual virus, as well as across other coronaviruses, as well as other common respiratory or common infections. Now, so what I'm showing you here is the evolution, coordination of the evolution of the SARS-CoV-2 response, the receptor binding domain. And I'm showing you every feature we analyzed in this group of acutely infected individuals compared to the evolution of the same features to the receptor binding domain. So what we're asking is if somebody made high levels of IgGs to this particular domain, did they also make high levels of IgAs? Did they make high levels of IgMs? Did they also make highly functional antibodies that could bind to FC receptors? And hopefully what you can see at this receptor binding domain triangle is that almost coordinated. So if you make one flavor of antibodies to the receptor binding domain, you also make very good and high levels of antibodies um, of other flavors to the same domain of the virus. But the same is true if you look at if somebody makes high levels of receptor binding domain antibodies, they also tend to make very highly functional antibodies to the spike. They also make very high levels of antibodies to the nucleocapsid. And so what this means is that individuals who make a strong response to one component of the virus also end up making lots of antibodies to other components of the virus. So there is this coordination in the response to this virus across multiple different targets. So these people mount very strong immunity across the entire virus when they make a strong response. So that heterogeneity we were seeing originally is really heterogeneity across the entire virus, not just to one or two components. Now, is this influenced by immunity to other coronaviruses? So we began to look at the coordination to two common coronaviruses, the HKU1 and NL63 virus that are relatively prevalent in the population, about 50 to 70% of us have immunity to these viruses. And these viruses tend to cause um, some relatively um, low level infections with some bronchiolitis. And hopefully what you can see here is that the relationships are not bright red. 
There's no stars, so there's no significance. So there's very little cross-reactivity in this evolving immune response to the SARS coronavirus with other common coronaviruses. So really very little evidence that we are leveraging or influenced by our pre-existing immunity to other coronaviruses and how we evolve immunity to the, this particular novel coronavirus. So what that means is that there's no advantage in the population and that we are all basically starting with a relatively clean slate when it comes to the humoral immune response to how we are responding to this virus. And this is very important because this means that there's no bias in how we respond to vaccination. And so this means that we can theoretically deploy vaccines in a way across everyone on a clean slate and look to see how we can try to augment the right quality of immunity equally across the whole population. Now, importantly, this is not true just for the common coronaviruses, but we also see no relationship to other respiratory pathogens, um, including RSV or flu. So, you know, you're not necessarily biased in any way if you've had other respiratory viruses, which is a very positive thing. Um, we are all starting off in the same level, and there's no bias with CMV, which is known to be obviously a um, disease that um, uh, uh, we get more immunity to uh, with age. So given the fact that we see this incredible heterogeneity of humoral immune responses, and we see that we're all starting off at the same level, the question everybody always wants to ask is, well, how do we get to these COVID passports? We, we heard a lot about this in the news and you know, folks in, in, in Europe saying that, well, as long as you have antibodies, you're protected. Well, I think that that might have been a little bit of an over-interpretation. So the question is, how do we get to this? And how do we begin to understand what flavors of immunity will get us to that passport? So I think it's important to understand what the tests are that we're using. And so we understand that if we measure RNA, we are actually um, capturing information about the infectiousness of a given individual, of their current status of essentially shedding the virus in their upper respiratory tract and their ability then to potentially propagate the infection. But this has nothing to do with immunity. On the other side, capturing the level of antibodies in individuals, number one, give us a measure of exposure. This means this individual has developed immunity to the virus. Whether that means they will not get reinfected is another question, but it means that they have developed an immune response. And by understanding the level of antibodies that are present in that individual that allows them to resist any future infections, that is the threshold that we would consider a COVID passport. Now, I want to just draw everyone's attention to these two graphs. I think it's important to understand how RNA and antibodies work together hand in hand in the diagnostic landscape. In a typical infection, what we would normally see is the rise of viral RNA in the upper respiratory tract, theoretically, and then later a rise in antibody levels that would then inform us afterwards that somebody has essentially cleared or controlled the infection. And this isn't a typical infection is how we would use RNA testing early and antibody testing later to understand truly who has been exposed to infection. Now what happens in SARS-CoV-2 infection is slightly different where we don't see necessarily this Gaussian distribution of RNA positivity. And instead, in many individuals, what we see is this transient shedding up and down in the upper respiratory tract. Some have thought about this as a resurgent of the virus, but really all it is is the fact that we have stochastic replication and shedding in the upper respiratory tract. And during this window of time, individuals are theoretically equally infectious because we can't capture somebody per hour or per day in the level of shedding that they can actually herd. A stable record of infection. They do not increase and decrease, but they stay positive and detectable after just a few days following symptom onset. And so what I wanna think about here is the fact that while RNA shedding may be transient, antibody production accrues. And so using these two methods of diagnosis are critically important to fully understand where the virus is and where the virus is moving in a given population. Now, what I also want us to think about is what the antibody tests mean. So there are multiple different tests out there. Some tests that are reading out the level of nucleocapsid positivity, so antibodies to this particular internal protein within the virus, 
which is highly abundant. And as I showed you earlier, come up, antibodies to this protein come up quite early. But the problem is that this is particular antigen is not a target of antibodies that will be protective because these antibodies would be hitting something that's inside the virus. So the antibodies would be relatively ineffective in recognizing that there's a virus present or an infection going on and clearing that particular pathogen. Conversely, there are also tests that recognize antibodies to the spikes, so these um, little uh, lollipops that sit on the top of the virus that are critical for attachment, as well as antibody tests to the receptor binding domain, as I mentioned here, which is a tiny region of the spike antigen that is involved in binding to the actual host cell. Now, antibodies to these two antigens are associated with protection. And even more interestingly, antibodies to the receptor binding domain have now been associated with vaccine-induced immunity. And so thinking about which ELISA tests we're using, what types of antibodies we are interrogating is critical to understand how we can really begin to build that COVID passport. So antibodies to these targets can help us build that passport, but antibodies to this antigen are unlikely to give us that necessary information. So what an antibody positive test really means is that you have been exposed. It does not mean you're necessarily immune. But what we are beginning to realize is that RBD specific, but not N specific antibodies are beginning to give us clues and hints about who might be immune. And seroepidemiological studies are now forming all across the country and across the world that are giving us this information. Where individuals who are convalescing, who have these incredibly diverse levels of antibodies in their blood, are now being followed over time to see whether or not there's any evidence of reinfection or additional pathology upon re-exposure to the virus within these given individuals to begin to define specifically what levels of antibodies are associated with immunity. And these thresholds is really what is critical in the vaccine development field to understand exactly what our target immune profile needs to look like so we can advance the best product forward. Now, the big problem that I wanna leave us with conceptually in the coronavirus community is really this one summarized here. And that is that coronavirus specific immunity is really transient, at least for other coronaviruses. So what I'm showing you on the left side are the lessons we've learned from other coronaviruses. These are the common coronaviruses. Where following infection, individuals raise very high levels of antibodies to the coronaviruses, but these antibody levels decline very rapidly. And in just one year, these individuals fall back to their pre existing antibody levels. So they really do not maintain any durability. That is true for their antibody titers, so their overall level of antibodies, but also for the ability of these antibodies to block viral infection through a process called neutralization. And you can see here that these neutralizing antibodies that prevent infection rise early, just like the titers, but they fall down to undetectable levels after just one year. So durability is very short-lived. And so whether or not we come up with the same rapid decay model where individuals who are exposed and convalesce will decline and lose their antibodies very rapidly, if they had high titers, they will decline um, as quickly, but they will decline uh, more, uh, they will have higher antibody levels for a longer period of time. Individuals who started off with lower titers perhaps will get lucky, lucky and will have a slower decay curve for this virus because it seems to be quite, um, uh, we get these nice titers in some individuals compared to other coronaviruses. Maybe we'll see these slower decay curves, or maybe because this virus is so prevalent and really present across the population, maybe we'll see environmental boosting and maybe we'll get lucky and we'll be okay for a period of time until the vaccines come along. But really what we don't understand yet is what levels of immunity come up and how long they will persist. And this is why it's so important to understand what levels of immunity are present and to track them over time.
So individuals are coming up with all kinds of models to get back to the university, to get back to work, to get back to schools. Um, these back to business uh, models have come up with um, lots of different ways of using PPE to protect ourselves, using different kinds of testing to try to inform who's infected. And you know, plans like the Romer plan have emerged where essentially you would like to identify everybody by RNA testing and understand who's truly infected and to quarantine individuals so that we can make sure that there's no additional spread. Unfortunately, as I mentioned before, these types of RNA testing plans really only give us a small window of information of individuals who are or happen to be shedding at that time, but do not provide us with a record of who has seen the virus, who has mounted some level of immunity, and who is likely to essentially um, potentially be prote protected from additional infection. So as we begin to think about better testing strategies that are not solely dependent on RNA, but also bringing in antibodies to really help us understand the level of burden in the population uh, using antibody testing, what we have begun to think about is an alternative strategy. And so what I want to talk about with you today is not just thinking about how we identify who is infectious, not just to think about who might have seen the virus, but maybe to find other types of biomarkers, antibody levels that are telling us about disease severity, and more importantly, telling us about who might be protected following infection, so we can begin to develop better clinical um, treatment plans for individuals once they're coming into the hospitals to help to unburden some of the, um, uh, the, the difficulty in uh, disease management um, based on individuals with different symptom levels. So what I'm gonna talk about now is really looking at antibodies in a slightly different way and thinking about how we can use them as biomarkers of disease severity, not just biomarkers of exposure to infection. So what I'm showing you here is a lovely cartoon that was generated by folks at Hopkins, just showing the different response, um, uh, uh, um, response profiles within the SARS coronavirus infection. This is all happening in the first few weeks of infection, where essentially early on, the first stage of infection is marked by this viral response, which is really associated with fever, dry cough, some diarrhea, headaches, and lymphopenia. And during this time, this is really when the immune response is ramping up to respond to this virus that's come into the system. Now, what happens very interestingly in this, in this SARS-CoV-2 infection is that individuals then switch into the second phase of this early response, where they switch from the viral response to a host inflammatory response, where now instead of solely trying to hit the virus, individuals start mounting these interesting inflammatory responses that are almost seem to be a host inflammatory reaction to the infection, but not necessarily driven by the virus itself. And this part of the infection course is marked by shortness of breath, abnormal chest um, imaging, and really the beginning of um, uh, detection of multiple different nonspecific inflammatory markers, including CRP, LDH, IL-6, D-dimers, and many others. Now, what's important about these markers that individuals are profiling over here is that they're not coronavirus specific. They do not seem to predict who's going to go on to develop ARDS, but they definitely are developing in tandem with these clinical complications. And so what we began to think about is how can we build better predictive markers? How can we begin to use immunology to help us think through how we can predict who's going to actually recover versus people who might need more intense um, support, medical support? And so we began to think about is the fact that the markers that we currently have in our toolkit are not specific to this virus. They can come up in any respiratory infection or really any type of infectious disease or non-infectious disease. They are poorly predictive. They don't come up early enough that it helps inform clinical trajectory. And so what we'd like to do is to identify some markers that are coronavirus specific that could predict disease course. So we asked ourselves a very simple question. Can we begin to use this heterogeneity of antibody profiles to begin to help us understand disease outcomes? So the way we went about doing that is to create a partnership with some colleagues out in Seattle. Really, at the very beginning of the epidemic, there was a very 
robust outbreak out in Seattle. And so we partnered with individuals out there that had begun to collect samples from individuals that were coming in and that were um, being admitted to the hospital. What um, my colleague Helen Chu did in, at Harborview Hospital is to begin to collect samples from individuals coming in with similar severe symptoms of infection. And what she did is essentially to capture plasma samples from the individuals at the time of hospitalization. These are the samples she sent to us to profile. All the individuals were caught between five and 10 days following infection. And what we did essentially is to take those antibodies and profile them. And after we profiled them, we linked them to disease outcome data. So we asked, was there any profile that we picked up very early on that was associated with convalescence or that came up in individuals who unfortunately passed away? So asking whether early antibody profiles could predict disease course. And the idea was really quite simple, was to look broadly at different antibody qualities, not only to look at the ability of antibodies to block infection by binding the virus and preventing it from getting into de novo cells, but to begin to also ask about all the other magical functions of antibodies and how they target and eliminate pathogens from the body after infection. And so what it turns out is that antibodies can do much more than just bind and block a virus. But once they recognize an infected cell, antibodies are able to draw in immune cells close enough to the infected cells that they can now begin to deploy the antiviral functions of the immune system to eliminate the pathogen and any infected cell to completely contain and cure infections. So we began to profile all of these different types of antibody profiles to begin to build a signature of immunity against the virus. So we captured antibody characteristics against the SARS coronavirus. We began to ask what are the different functions of antibodies across all these individuals. And we began to use this information to begin to understand if there was any signature of antibodies early on in infection that could inform whether or not somebody was going to convalesce or pass away. So we captured a lot of data. Every line, every row represents a different individual we profiled. And every column represents a different feature of the immune response that we profiled. And again, we profiled the response against the spike. So this region here, the umbrella on top of the virus involved an attachment receptor binding domain, the region of the spike that's involved in binding to the host cell, and again, to the nucleocapsid protein that's found within the virus that may not be important for immunity, but acts as a very important biomarker of the response to the infection. And hopefully what you can see again, by capturing lots of data from these individuals, every individual mounted their own unique response to the virus. So everyone was different in how they mounted an immune response to the virus. We began to see some differences where, for example, individuals who passed away tended to have more red in this part portion of their immune response, and individuals who convalesced tended to be more blue in other parts of their immune response. And so the question really began to emerge was, was there a potentially multivariate or overall flavor of immunity that was associated with protection following infection? So what I'm showing you over here are the overall levels of antibodies, um, the major isotypes that we measure with diagnostics, again, against the spike receptor binding domain or the nucleocapsid protein. On the blue is the distribution of the This is a small population of individuals but the distribution of the response is in individuals who convalesce on the left versus those who passed away, unfortunately, in the brown. And we're looking at the responses for IgG1, our workhorse, IgA, which is important for mucosal immunity, or IgM, which is important for early immunity to the virus. And we found is for most of these responses, there was no difference at these early time points across the two groups. So the overall amount of antibody is not predictive of protection or later convalescence. There was a slight difference in IgM levels early to the spike antigen, and that was interesting. So that got us thinking, well, even though it's not really 
quantity that matters, for some of these isotypes might be something interesting going on. So we began to think about this a little bit more um, like a multivariate profile, began to think about how we can look at this as a flavor of an immune response. So what I'm going to show you now is what these flavors of immunity look like. And the way I'm going to show it to you is in the shape of a flower. So what we have over here are flowers on the top that are the responses in individuals who pass away. And the bottom, these are flowers that are present individuals who go on to convalesce. And the way to read these flowers is these flowers here are, are the nucleocapsid response. And the flowers over here are the ones directed to the spike antigen. Now, the size of the petal represents how strong the response was in that given population. And the color of the petal in the purpley blue represent different subclasses and isotypes of COV2 immunity. And on the orange yellow, are the functional abilities of these SARS coronavirus responses. And so what I wanna draw your attention to first is the nucleocapsid response. And hopefully what you can see here is this flower is much bigger in the individuals who pass away compared to the individuals who go on to convalesce. So there's a significant difference in the size of the petals in the individuals who pass away. So they make a more dominant response to the internal not necessarily protective nucleocapsid antigen. Conversely, if we now look at the individuals who convalesce, hopefully what you can see here is here we have more of an explosion of the responses to the spike antigen, which is involved in attachment to the host. And this is bigger for most of these parameters in the convalescence compared to individuals who go on to pass away. So what this showed us for the first time is that there was a different flavor of immunity coming up in individuals just five to 10 days following symptoms where individuals who go on to pass away make a response directed largely to the nucleocapsid and they're mounting lots of functions and flavors whereas the individuals who go on to convalesce over here in the bottom tend to make a more dominant response to the spike antigen an antigen that is more relevant to protection against infection. And even more interestingly, we saw this very interesting redirection of the functions in the petals, where the convalescents really like to draw in complement, antibody dependent complement deposition, as well as antibody dependent phagocytosis, both from neutrophils as well as monocytes. And these are highly enriched in individuals who go on to control the disease compared to individuals who go on and pass away. So this was really fascinating. We wanted to ask the question, is this really true in a rigorous, unsupervised fashion? So we used machine learning to take all this information and ask the question, do these flavors of antibodies truly provide some resolution in who's gonna go on to be protected versus who is not? And so what I'm showing you over here is the model that emerged following infection, following this machine learning algorithm that showed very clearly um, individuals here that convalesce in the blue versus those who passed away in the brown and shows quite interestingly that these individuals have very different antibody functional profiles where individuals who are protected make higher levels of spike specific IgMs and IgAs and individuals who pass away make higher responses to the nucleocapsid antigen, both with respect to IgM, IgA, as well as complement deposition, which has been implicated in pathology and disease. And we can look at this in a little bit more granular way and ask what are these biomarkers associated with? And we find lots of different functions where phagocytic activity and complement deposition to the spike antigen, not to the nucleocapsid, are associated with protective immunity. Now, to leave a little time for questions at the end, I think I will zip through to the conclusion if that's okay. Um, but I wanna leave you with this last thought um, that vaccination can significantly attenuate viral replication. We've seen this now in multiple animal models that have come up. And what I think is really important what I hopefully can leave you with is this idea that phagocytosis and complement deposition are key antibody correlates of immunity in humans, and we've begun to see this also in monkeys in recent papers that have emerged following vaccination. 
So we believe that studies of vaccination and natural immunity, looking at antibody function or flavors to the right targets is really what is key to inform exactly how we get these COVID passports. And so this is really where we want to push over the next few months to begin to inform vaccine down selection as well as vaccine development pushing towards the signatures that we are seeing are tracking with better disease outcome um, across populations. And with that, I wanna thank the folks who are involved in the work, thank a group of graduate students that worked right through this epidemic, you know, every day and every night to make sure that we could really understand antibody profiles at a granular level. Many collaborators, including folks in Seattle who sent us the first samples, Helen Chu at the center of the outbreak, and all of our funders and all of you for your attention. Bravo. Thank you so much. <laughs> There's a, a, a story about respiratory syncytial virus. When they first started looking for vaccines with respiratory syncytial virus, they found that the vaccines that they were making actually made the viral infection worse rather than better. Uh, and they actually had to back up on respiratory syncytial virus uh, and then restart and go in a different direction. Is there any reason for us to be concerned based on the history of what happened with respiratory syncytial virus that we're not going to get what we want uh, in this process? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So there's a fear in this community about antibody dependent enhancement. So there is a real tangible paralysis actually in the vaccine development community because of the fear of what happened in RSV. Um, and it also happened um, in a monkey model that was published last year against the SARS coronavirus one variant where an MVA vaccine, so a pox viral vector based vaccine induced antibodies that drove incredibly high levels of pathogenesis in monkeys, really pointing the possibility that antibodies can enhance infection with the SARS coronavirus or coronaviruses in general, but potentially also to coronavirus two because it's so similar to coronavirus one. I have to say that in all the studies, in all the monkey studies that we've profiled so far, including many that are moving forward um, into human testing, we have not seen any evidence of enhancement. But that being said, there are a few monoclonal antibody studies that are emerging in animals that do suggest that there can be some enhancement and morbidity induced by the administration of antibodies. So I think that my message in response to that question is to this day, we don't really understand what led to enhancement for RSV, right? That was not studied deeply. For dengue, we understand why it happens and how it happens. And the same parameters, the same reasons why dengue causes enhancement is you know, because of all the variability across the dengue serotypes. We don't have the same issue here with SARS-CoV-2. We don't have that level of variation in the antigen. So we don't have any reason to believe that the dengue enhancement is gonna happen in SARS coronavirus to infection. But that being said, if we don't understand the deeper immunology, and how these antibodies provide protection, we do have the possibility of ending up selecting a vaccine that could potentially be not perfect or might cause some sort of problems. And so really uh, you know, coupling immunology and deep investigation with vaccine development is really key as we accelerate this vaccine development pipeline because God forbid we put something out in populations that are gonna cause problems, but it is a real tangible fear. Thank you. Okay, let me go into these questions. So what is your take on the recent report suggesting the Sabin polio vaccine may be beneficial for SARS-CoV-2 infection? Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of really interesting stories out there about the polio vaccine being, import, being potentially protective. BCG might be protective. People said that measles might be protective. I think that the data is really controversial. I think the one thing that we know for sure is that all of these vaccines prime innate immunity right? They, they augment your immune response that naturally makes you slightly more resistant to other infections. Whether that's durable, programmable, and going to be equivalently protective across populations, I think jury is out. 
but I know that there are at least two large BCG trials, one happening in Amsterdam and one happening in Australia, where they're looking to see whether BCG can provide cross pathogen immunity to coronaviruses. And so we'll see there if there is this real evidence of cross uh, pathogen immunity. Um, polio is one of the ones that might be interesting from a mucosal perspective, um, but I think they've decided to move forward with BCG as the major investments because of its um, clear um, epidemiological link to protection uh, to measles and mumps and rubella and others. But it's a very interesting hypothesis. Were the IgA level, IgA antibody levels measured in serum or saliva? Everything I showed you today is all measured in the serum. IgA levels are very high in the serum. Um, really interesting for long protracted periods of time. IgA antibodies um, are detectable, but interestingly, they have been um, more erratic in our antibody diagnostic efforts. We've not been able to consistently always see IgA in the saliva. And so we've moved most of our diagnostics still to stick with dry blood spots and venous punctures as opposed to moving to saliva, although there are many groups that are thinking about concentration and potentially buccal um, saliva collections to try to really make sure they're capturing the freshest, more, most abundant antibodies, and that might end up making saliva testing more effective. Why does severe respiratory disease persist for so long despite rapid rise in antibodies? Okay, well, that's a really cool question. So um, this came up early, you know, I guess this question um, at 424, and hopefully by the time we got to 450, that kind of made sense. Um, they're hitting the wrong antigen. I think is what's happening. And so I think that if your response is to S, to spike early, that's a very good thing. But if you start hitting nucleocapsid early, I think that becomes a deleterious response. You're going down the wrong path. Um, is the antibody dependent enhancement a concern for SARS-CoV-2? <laughs> if so, would that influence vaccine development? This is the biggest paralytic um, uh, of effect in the field right now. You know, we're trying to warp speed development for all vaccines. We have this feeling that there might be the possibility of enhancement. And without coupling enough deep immunology into the development of these vaccines, there is the possibility that we are going to potentially do something dangerous. I think to counter um, act that possibility, BARDA, FDA, CEPI, Gates Foundation have all um, begun to solicit um, really some of the best antibody enhancement assays out there. And so folks are developing both in vivo and in vitro testing approaches to begin to truly understand whether enhancement occurs and to begin to develop surrogate markers that can very rapidly be applied to any vaccine platform to ensure that we are truly selecting vaccines that only elicit protected antibodies and not those that enhance. Um, does negative antibody testing mean never infected? Okay, that's a tough one. So um, there are a few individuals who sneak by in antibody testing. We've done some pretty rigorous profiling across thousands of individuals. We have seen that individuals in some cases that are um, uh, immune deficient um, at the time of testing, either due to, you know, in some, one case with rituximab therapy, in another case um, was, uh, I, I think the individual had um, another B cell lymphoma. Interestingly, we, they did slip through and we didn't see antibody positivity. And so it really is an issue. But interestingly, I think that what ha did come up from those individuals is that you do see that even if they don't have IgGs, they do have IgM. Hmm. Interestingly, so they did seem to have another isotype positive response. And so I think coupling multiple isotypes might be a way to ensure that we're not missing those individuals. But some close attention has to be paid to individuals who might be A gamma globulinemic. Um, out of the three hypothetical scenarios of a titer decay, which one is preliminarily, uh, what are we pointing towards? Yeah, it's looking like the fast decay. Unfortunately, it's really quite um, scary. Uh, that being said, this is in the timing of uh, strict more strict isolation, I sh should say. Now that people are reemerging, we're hoping that we're going to see some environmental boosting because, as you all know, there is um, an increase in infections happening, and so we're we're really closely monitoring populations of individuals who are really going out there um, on a daily basis. And so we think that there might be the possibility that now in the summer with more um, you know, social interactions that we will see some boosting. 
What are your thoughts about SARS-CoV-2 immune individual receiving a vaccine? Oh yeah, so that's a really interesting question. So um, interestingly, most of the trials um, are not gonna be pre-testing for antibody positivity. Mm -hmm. And so many of the trials, the Moderna trial is starting next week or in a couple of weeks, as well as the um, AstraZeneca trial are not antibody testing before at the time of enrollment. They are testing afterwards. And so whether or not those pre-existing antibodies are gonna interfere or get boosted by vaccination is gonna be very interesting. Um, I have a feeling that, that there will not be a negative predictor of response to vaccination. I, I really don't think that there's gonna be um, any, there's no reason to believe that they're gonna um, prevent a, a response to the vaccine, but certainly it's going to change the power calculations and how we're going to read out protection. And very importantly, the um, vaccine trials network that are driving these have built in a rapid adaptive clinical trial design into all their studies to be able to ensure that they can add more individuals, if many are antibody positive, so they can truly build enough power in their studies to see the potential effects of the vaccine on protection. Does the antibody response vary with age or sex of the patients? Um, sex, we have not seen differences, interestingly, but age, absolutely. Individuals who are older in studies that have come out of China, very large studies of populations, suggest that elderly populations have higher titers of antibodies mm. and they tend to have more neutralizing activity. Mm. Why they do not protect then is the big question. And so one possibility that folks keep throwing around is the idea that magnitude or titer is not the correlate of protection. And hopefully that came through in my presentation that that really does seem to be coming out as a critical predictor. It's not the amount, it's the quality that matters. Have you done or know labs that have done an investigation profiling of T-cell exhaustion receptors in patients infected with coronavirus 2? Yes, so there are, there's a study, um, I believe, on BioRix uh, from Michael Betts's lab, as well as one from John Weary's lab, both at UPenn, that have done a very deep profiling exercise on acutely infected patients with SARS-CoV-2, and they have seen a very rapid expansion of PD-1 lag-3 TIGIT positive T cells in these individuals, um, and they do seem to track with severity of disease. So the higher the exhaustion level or activation level with these markers, higher levels of viremia and disease in the individuals. So they're tracking very closely with severity of disease, which is very interesting, um, a very important marker of disease progression. How does this relate to underlying comorbidities? Yeah, so this is really interesting. So what we know is that individuals who are diabetic or have high BMIs tend to make a more TH2 biased immune response. And so these individuals tend to make different flavors of antibodies, and this is really important. If you are now predisposed towards making less functional antibodies, and antibodies that are not as capable of eliciting the functions that are critical for protection, these individuals might be more susceptible to early infection, poor immune responses, dissemination, and eventual uh, um, loss of control of the virus. And so we're now in the process of running a very large cohort of 600 acutely infected individuals that are stratified by BMI and age to understand the interaction of at least those two comorbidities in driving um, differential early immune responses, just in case we might have to make vaccines differentially available to different populations. It may not be a one size fit all. And I think it's really important to keep in mind. There might be one vaccine that'll be great for middle-aged individuals. There might be another vaccine that'll be great for kids. There might be another vaccine that's gonna be great for uh, individuals in the um, elderly age group. And the nice thing is that we have 130 vaccines being tested right now or in development, five of which are moving into humans at light speed. So we have flavors of vaccines that we can theoretically couple to flavors of immune protection. So we can begin to really do something we've never done before in the vaccine space, but really begin to tailor vaccines to the right population to drive the best kind of immunity. Uh, um, could you provide a bit more detail on the unsupervised learning algorithm methods you use? Um, could you email me? Because that is kind of a little bit um, of a longer discussion. We use a uh, lasso down selection, which basically reduces the features, followed by PLSDA. And if you have more questions, just email me. 
Any evidence of possibility of antibody-dependent enhancement? Okay, I answered that one. Does blood group A correlate with spike nucleocapsid antibodies? We don't know yet. We're in the process of collecting that data. We have to pull it out of the MRMs to be able to look at that. Also, do antibody profiles correlate with cytokine storm? Can individuals already infected with a SARS-CoV serotype a develop immunity can be infected with other serotypes? So that's really interesting. So, um, so cytokines, so yeah, so yeah, so antibody um, profiles are definitely predating the tracking with the severity of um, the cytokine storms. We see that individuals who have more of a biased nucleocapsid response tend to develop a much stronger cytokine storm. So it seems to be highly correlated whether the immune complexes themselves are driving the storm and driving the disease is the question we're trying to understand if maybe the antibodies drive complement, complement then drives pathology, pathology then drives inflammation is the circuit we're trying to understand. And this is the circuit we believe is where IVIG and um, passively transferred antibodies might be interrupting. This may be why IVIG is providing some benefit, even though in general IVIG is not SARS-CoV-2 specific. So that is something we're trying to understand. Um, and the serotype protection, I think we will only begin to understand from the serosurveillance studies, but I don't believe the serotypes are that different from one another. So I'm not really convinced that we will see that, but you know, the data will speak louder than any uh, presupposed uh, hypotheses. Um, so do different polyvalent vaccines given at different stages is what is likely to work? Right now, there are no polyvalent vaccines. There's only one valent vaccine, which is to the spike antigen. I have not heard yet of any uh, polyvalent vaccines that are out there, although there are people are talking about cross-cov responses potentially. Um, uh, and that might be something we could do to try to drive cross-coronavirus immunity. Um, what is interesting is in some populations, in, in some animals, we are seeing that immunity um, from this vaccine is driving protection or is driving antibodies to other coronaviruses that are more similar, like SARS-1. And so maybe the possibility to get cross-coronavirus immunity, but I, I don't, I am not aware of any polyvalent vaccines, but there might be some other that I don't know about. Do you first see the viral mutations, especially in surface exposed spike, and they lead to vaccine escape? And what are the implications for durable vaccines? That is a huge question. Right now, um, we do see that the antibodies elicited by some of the vaccines that are moving forward very quickly still bind to these new escape variants in the spike protein. That being said, whether they will continue to provide protection is the big question. And that is another issue that's coming up very um, you know, at the front of all conversations um, in the vaccine development field to make sure that we are testing um, to ensure that we are still getting protection against these new viral variants. And it is a scary thought that the virus is able to mutate. Right now, it still looks like we're okay, but you know, we will only see in the next few months. Any concern for evidence of escape mutations? Okay, we answered that, yes. And could drugs that block nucleocapsid antibodies be used to reduce enhancement of bad immune responses by a vaccine? Okay, well, so the good news is um, for um, uh, John Davenport is that um, most of the vaccines that are out there right now are all to the spike antigen. We have very few that are targeting nucleocapsid. So whether that was just pure luck or whether that was rational design, I'm not entirely sure, but I think we're in good shape um, for at least most of the synthetic vaccines. For the attenuated vaccines, it may be an issue because there are some attenuated strains out there. Um, but um, I think, I think the, the way that I envision it is as long as you have enough spike antibodies that are functional early on, whether they block through mutation or through some other phagocytic or complement depositing function, they might outcompete the badness of nucleocapsid very early on when you have low viremia. But that we will only be able to determine later on uh, over time in these animal models that are all appearing. But I think that the important point to leave you all with is that over the next month or two, BioRix will be flooded by vaccine studies and animal studies. So all of your questions will be answered in the next <laughs> few weeks. So just keep reading, <laughs> you know, not peer reviewed, but that's where the answers will pop up. And I, and I do think that um, we're on the right track with the vaccines, although there are still challenges on the horizon. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. What a terrific talk and uh, great discussion. Thank you from for all the attendees, for your uh, interest, and um, Galit, uh, Galit, I should say, sorry, uh, we really enjoyed this, and uh, it's a 
great way for us to uh, end the series. Jack, do you have uh, additional uh, comments? Just that it was tremendous. It's just absolutely tremendous. And uh, I agree with you. It's a, in fact, I'm sad we're ending the series, to be honest with you. I, uh, I've enjoyed these more than I, I can say. So uh, maybe, maybe we'll have to rethink that whole. <laughs> yeah, I, I was even wondering, uh, we might solicit comments, uh, email comments from uh, folks who have been attending as to, you know, topics that they might be interested in in the, fu in the future. But anyway, thank you again. And uh, have a lovely uh, rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.